uh, anxiety in late life. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do. And obviously, Dr. Lombardi, um, I'm open to any of your input. I am by no means the expert on this particular topic, but I, I am happy to speak towards it. <laughs> uh, so I'll first talk about um, what different types of anxiety um, sort of exist, sort of how do we categorize this in our heads as psychiatrists, um, primarily based around the constructs that are described in the DSM-5. The more common, I think, conceptualization, conceptualization or kind of thinking of what anxiety is, probably if it's generalized anxiety disorder, the best. This is probably what most people think of when they think anxiety. This is an excessive anxiety that's constantly there. It's there for a long time. People are worried about different things. They find it hard to control the worry. And uh, DSM-5 does require three or more of the following symptoms in addition to those first two criteria, which include restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating or mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. Uh, so I'm sure many of us can picture uh, patients of ours that sort of fit this category. Uh, I think that when it comes to sort of geriatric um, sort of interesting tidbits, uh, some potential differences is the type of worry, or not the type of worry, but the, the, the content of worry might be more attuned to what someone's experiencing in late life, including worry about loved ones, uh, losses, life transitions, uh, socioeconomic factors um, being common ones there. Another sort of thing to keep in mind is that with older adults, it may be more difficult to tease out whether some of these symptoms are anxiety or something else. So things like fatigue, memory issues, muscle tension, sleep disturbance could very well be explained by other things. So in that sense, uh, generalized anxiety disorder may not be as clear cut. but certainly something that it would be worth keeping on your differential diagnosis um, when you're considering the symptoms. I forgot to mention just now, I always leave this off, but the DSM always includes additional criteria which are common amongst all the disorders, which are that these are uh, clearly impacting function, uh, that they are not better explained by another illness and not better explained by another mental health condition. The uh, next slide uh, actually describes a few other types of anxiety that you might come across. Uh, these are all examples of anxiety disorders that fall under that category of anxiety, so the anxiety chapter in the DSM-5. I thought I'd mention specific phobia, given that we might more commonly see fear of falling in older adults that is sort of described as the most common specific fear um, in this population and kind of unique to this population. Uh, panic disorder, is worth mentioning, is uh, sort of recurrent, unexpected panic attacks. They occur out of the blue um, or with certain um, uh, triggers, but generally speaking, recurrent and difficult to um, predict. Uh, this is differentiated by panic attacks in and of themselves. So I mentioned that we often can use panic attack um, we have a panic attack specifier that we can attach to other diagnoses. For example, PTSD with panic attacks or uh, generalized anxiety disorder with panic attacks. So that the panic disorder is technically a separate disorder um, as opposed to a panic attack being sort of linked to an already existing or different um, disorder. Uh, I also wanna mention that CSM-5 added the anxious distress specifier to major depressive disorder. So you may see us in psychiatry say something like major depressive disorder with anxious distress. Uh, I think an alternative to this is, um, or sort of the closest alternative to this is major depressive disorder and adding a separate diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. The reason to use anxious distress is uh, the idea that major depressive disorder in many patients have an anxious quality, but that this anxiety is specifically tied to the depression itself. So the anxious distress is present during the majority of days uh, during a depressive episode and primarily around that depressive episode. And the criteria for uh, using that specifier, anxious distress, are far less than a generalized anxiety disorder criteria. You only need two of the following, which are feeling tense, restlessness, difficulty, concentrating due to worry, fear something awful might happen, or the fear that, uh, or the feeling that someone might, themselves might lose control. So I hope that gives you a sense of how um, I might conceptualize how anxiety looks. Uh, even though I can understand that a lot of times it all sort of blends together and it feels like one, you know, kind of a blurring or spectrum of, of symptoms, but there are ways to try to tease out 
um, some specific phenotypes to help us in, in uh, further um, treatment. All right, I'll go ahead and now review uh, a couple of um, screeners that you can use in your practice uh, if you like. Uh, generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD-7, is something that you've probably seen or heard of. Um, this is uh, really commonly used in all populations, and there are there has been a look at this particular rating scale or screener in geriatric patients. And I put this up here to make sure that you have a sense of what it looks like. Uh, and this was originally based on the DSM-4 criteria. So it does look different from the DSM-5, but it's still valid or validated. Uh, and what they have, what this, this particular screener does is has the respondent not only acknowledge whether they have a particular symptom in the past two weeks, but how frequently. So in some ways, give you a sense of severity. So the symptoms include feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge, not being able to stop or control worrying, worrying too much, trouble relaxing, restlessness, irritability, and just this fear of something awful that might be happening. And again, this is something that you can have them fill out in your waiting room or use this as a tool as you're trying to uh, better quantitate what their symptoms are and how severe they are doing. So you could do that uh, you know, in, a, in a session or in a visit together. Uh, in terms of cutoffs for general um, use, the cutoff is 10 or greater, meaning 10 or greater reports, further assessment. Uh, but I did come across a validation study of older adults back in 2014 that suggests a cutoff of five or greater has the better sort of properties around it with a sensitivity of 0.63 and, and a specificity of 0.9. Um, so it's, it's, it's an okay screener. Um, there's another one that can be used in the geriatric inventory, or uh, geriatric anxiety inventory. And I've just included the short form here. Uh, uh, the full form is actually 20 questions. It's fully free and available online. Um, but I pulled out the short form uh, as something that's easier to read and probably something you might more easily implement, again, as a screener that you can have a patient do in the office while they're waiting. Uh, so this is a little easier perhaps for older adults with some degree of cognitive impairment because you don't need that Likert scale. You don't need to quantitate how often you're experiencing a symptom in the past two weeks. You simply ask yes or no or agree or disagree. Uh, I worry a lot of the time. Little things bother me a lot. I often feel nervous. My own thoughts often make me anxious. I think of myself as a nervous person. And um, the, the cutoff here is three or greater as warranting further assessment for anxiety. So those are some ideas for you in terms of screening. Now, I actually don't have a lot of slides because I'm anticipating some questions <laughs> about treatment. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and preface this by saying that uh, the, the treatments that are being used for older adults are by and large the same as, as younger adults, um, but the same sort of geriatric principles apply uh, when it comes to pharmacotherapy. Um, and uh, for any, any probably almost any disorder, which is that side effect profiles um, are, need to be borne uh, more into um, care and, and decision making, and uh, that the risks are um, perhaps a bit greater and uh, will weigh into the decision about what treatment to work towards. Uh, psychotherapy is really, um, I feel like over the past five to 10 years, the, the psychotherapy um, uh, sort of literature around this has, has improved substantively uh, with cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety kind of shining or showing some um, good support in older adults uh, for, for anxiety in particular. Uh, there are some other modalities that are out there um, that are um, considered helpful. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy is one type and mindfulness-based stress reduction or relaxed training are another. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy refers to uh, kind of better examining uh, sort of thought patterns, logging thought patterns, um, seeing what uh, uh, you know, insight can be gained from that and making adjustments. Uh, there's also a behavior component where being exposed to positive activities or even being exposed to those stressful activities to uh, kind of desensitize someone to anxious producing sort of situations is another way to uh, go about it. So cognitive behavioral therapy um, is pretty nice and flexible in that way, although the other approaches um, are also uh, very good. Uh, I'm going to mention the medications because most of you are probably um, prescribers and will be 
um, asked about whether a medication, you know, patient's not going to necessarily come to you asking you to provide uh, therapy. They're going to ask you, hey, is there a medication that can help with this? Um, in older adults, this still predominant um, suggestion or recommendation are the SSRIs and SNRIs. Uh, and um, you know, I've listed a few other medications that can be used um, in sort of order of preference. Um, Buspirone, uh, good tolerability profile to that medication, and I've found helpful for many of my patients with anxiety disorders. Pregabalin, uh, not necessarily um, FDA approved here, but the European Union has pregabalin uh, approved for use for generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, so that is something to consider. Um, mirtazapine, I had trouble finding literature to support a lot of mirtazapine in older adults, except for a study of long-term care patients that suggested those patients on mirtazapine were less likely or were, had fewer benzodiazepine prescriptions. So that's also something, something to look at. Um, I include quetiapine and benzodiazepines not because I necessarily recommend them, but I, I do see them used and sometimes for treatment, really treatment uh, refractory anxiety. Um, these are some medications as a specialist I will look at. Uh, quetiapine does have some work in, in treatment, um, some, some evidence or some study or research rather uh, around um, in, in, you know, generalized anxiety disorder. And of course, benzodiazepines have been around for quite a long time. All right, so I have three minutes for questions. Anyone have any questions or comments? Or we can end early. <laughs>